thank you so much for staying. <laughs> and um, as mentioned, the bad news is I'm the guy stopping you getting a drink. The good news is that when you get a drink, you get a book, if you want one, for free. My new book, which is called Value Web. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because the subtitle of Value Web is how fintech companies are building the internet of value using open source technologies. And the open source structure of finance is where we have a challenge for the incumbent banks, which is the focus of my previous book, Digital Bank, which is saying that the incumbent banks have spent centuries building a physical structure of distribution of finance in paper form that's focused on buildings and humans, and then they apply technology on top. And now they've got to rip that apart and start with how do we do the digital distribution of data through the globalized network of the internet with software and servers, and then what buildings and humans need to sit on top. It's a fundamental restructuring of the financial system and of the incumbent system. Um, I blog every day at thefinancer.com. That, that's free. So if you want to know what I thought of the LinkedIn Finex Tech Day, you'll find out uh, in my blog over the next few days or weeks. And equally, um, as mentioned, I spend all my time looking at the future. I do actually f live in a museum in Britain. Um, although when people say, where do you live? I actually, if I'm truthful, I live in British Airways Lounge. Um, but uh, the museum is the historic dockyard in Chatham, which is uh, the technology that built the capability for Britain to have an empire at one point in that we had ropes that were technologically better than everyone else's, and that was built in the museum where I live. But actually, I spend all my time on this question. What's the future? <laughs> where are we going? What's the future? That's what we all want to know. But the reason why living in a museum is quite a good thing is that to find out about the future, you need to look at the past. And when we look at the past, in the very recent past, and you may have seen this slide going around the network if you haven't seen it, the guys in green are all digital giants in the US. GAFA, as you might call them, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Just 15 years ago, there was only Microsoft. And uh, you know, times have changed considerably. So there's something fundamental happening. And people call it the platformification effect. I really don't like that word. It sounds a bit like Californication. Um, but platforms, marketplaces, is the difference in that we're living in a world where brand new companies are getting higher valuations than com companies that have hundreds of years of existence, some of which have disappeared completely. And the new platform companies don't build everything. People come to their marketplaces to build. And so as a result, the number of people in these new digital giants are just thousands or hundreds or tens compared to the historical giants that are the physical heavy lifting firms. These old firms are the industrial era firms that do heavy physical lifting of everything, whereas we do digital platforms, and that's global and viral. And that's a fundamental difference of where we are today. In fact, when you look at the industrial era, and the industrial era has many things that still resonate now, one of the key things in the industrial era is that we launched financial services as we know it today. In almost every country, the insurance firms, the banks, are hundreds of years old. And because of those hundreds of years of growing, acquiring, merging, it ends up that you typically only have three or four big ones in every country. So here you've got a big four, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citi, JP Morgan Chase. In the UK, you've got a big four, HSBC, Barclays, RBS, NatWest, and Lloyds, who celebrated 250 years of existence last year. 250 years. The oldest bank in Britain is Barclays, 1692. JP Morgan Chase chases its roots back to 1799. The result of that is that you have hundreds of thousands of people who've been doing heavy lifting of finance in a paper-based form, and now they have to be digital because the world is shifting on its axis, as we see with those other heavy lifting monolith firms. But these firms have monopolies. They're the oldest firms in most countries. And so how are they going to change? And the reason why they're the oldest firms is that they were created specifically so we could do industrial revolution trade and commerce using paper-based notes and checks issued by these banks that were licensed by governments. And we could put the check in the post 
what an innovation that was at the time. Unfortunately, it's still the case today in that this is not really appropriate because it's very slow and it's ex expensive. I recently got a check in the post from an American client. It was for $25,000. Woohoo! <laughs> Lovely. Um, took 28 days to process because it has to go through the counterparty network. My bank said, we're not going to put the funds in your account until we get the funds in our account from those Americans. Thank you. They charged me $200 for doing that for 28 days. And I was not particularly impressed in the age of the internet. Why is it that people are putting checks in the post? It's mad. I want something that's immediate and free. And that's what the value web's all about, fast and free value exchange, globally, one-to-one. -one. You know, we're all connected globally, one-to-one. -one. If I called you, I don't expect you to pick up that phone 28 days later. It's mad. So this is what the value web's all about. And the value web's basically really important because you can't have an internet of things without an internet of value. The reason being is that we're very soon going to have billions of people who have tens of things on the internet. Cars, homes, windows, doors, shoes, handbags, and maybe even a mobile <laughs> and a watch. And how are those things going to actually transact? When you've got trillions of things transacting in real time all the time, non-stop, 24 by 7, in very small amounts. Can't do that through a 28-day-old counterparty messaging system. We need a new system. And the system's being built right now based on smartphones and the mobile network linking into the internet. S soon smart everything, it's not just smartphones. And this interesting idea of a blockchain. And these, to me, are the two foundation technologies of the Internet of Value, because they can build the fast, free network globally, one-to-one. -one. So let's look at what that means. We've already heard from some of the sessions earlier on about the virality of the Internet and how it's changing the game. When Ellen DeGeneres at the Oscars can tweet a picture and it gets three million shares by the end of the program, it shows we live in a global viral network. And that global viral network's impacting on banking, specifically because of these two guys over here. If you don't know who Iqram and Andy are, they're two guys who are developers. Um, maybe you can tell that from that picture. Um, and in 2011, Ikram visited Andy and forgot his wallet. And so for the weekend, Andy was writing down on a bit of paper every time that he subbed Ikram some money for a panini or martini or cappuccino or whatever. And by the end of the weekend, gave him the note and said, there you are, you owe me $56.48. Ikram went home, was writing a check in the post. And then thought, we're millennials. <laughs> we're developers. Why am I doing this? We both use PayPal. Why didn't I pay you with PayPal? Because PayPal's for big transactions. OK, well, let's develop something for small transactions on PayPal. And they called it Venmo. Now, you all know what's happened with Venmo. Luckily, they sold out to Braintree in 2012 for $26.2 million. Woohoo! Could have been a unicorn, guys. Braintree's bought by PayPal for $800 million in 2013. 2016, in Q2, Venmo processed $4 billion in payments, the biggest social payments app in the world for small payments for friends. It was $2.5 billion in Q4, 2015. So that's grown pretty significantly. It was $4.9 billion in Q3 2016. So it's growing at 25% per quarter in payments volumes. That's significant. That's viral. Viral and social payments. But it's much more fundamental than that because we're seeing the transformation specifically taking place in emerging and developing economies. I spend a lot of time flying, as mentioned, and I spend a lot of time in Africa and Philippines, Indonesia, Brazil, um, and see the change that we're getting f in getting the banked population available through the mobile wallet network. But it's not banking. It's financial inclusion. Financial inclusion means something different to banking. Because banking, because it's physically distributed, is only really developed for the very rich. It's actually very expensive if you're poor to move money. That's the reason why the poor don't have much money, because every time they try and move money, they get a lot of fees 
from remittance providers, that's going to disappear in the next 10 years. Right now, everybody in the world has access to a mobile phone near enough. On the African continent, the figure there is 82%. Just a year before, it was 69%. Right now, the cheapest smartphone is $30. A smartphone is $30. These guys are using old 2G phones in some instances. But even with a 2G phone, you've got a transformation because I can text money immediate, in real time, one-to-one -to, -one, to everyone globally. As a result, 19 countries in sub-Saharan Africa now have more people using mobile wallets than bank accounts. One in three people who have a mobile subscription in sub-Saharan African countries uses it to transfer money through a mobile wallet. Tanzania, in particular, is leading the game because they have interoperability between all the mobile providers, so you don't have any fees transferring between different mobile networks. Soon that's going to go across border to Kenya, Uganda, Ghana. Maybe not Kenya, because MPES is a bit of a control freak monopoly, but that's another story. And specifically what it means is that this guy who could only sell to the local village can now sell across the whole of the country or across the whole of the continent or across the whole of the world. He's got an Instagram account. He's got a Facebook page. He's got a mobile wallet to take money, value, digitally, in real time, anytime, all the time. Transformational. So we're seeing suddenly one fundamental change that I think is the biggest change. And it's not this Internet of Things, it's not the Internet of Value, it's not blockchain, it's not open sourcing finance. It's actually 7 billion people being connected one-to-one -one and transferring trade and transactions and talk non-stop. We've never had a planet connected, everybody connected, because we had distance before. There's no distance anymore. Everyone's connected. And what's interesting in this context is the United Nations has some specific goals to make this a self-sustaining planet by the year 2030 that's actually giving everybody clean living, healthy capabilities. They've got hundreds of sub-objectives against each of these goals. But goal number 16 is quite interesting. Promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. And specifically, goal 16.9, give everyone a legal identity. This goal is really important because right now, there are a lot of people who don't have an identity. They are not born officially. They don't exist officially. About two billion of the seven billion people on the planet don't exist because there's no records of their existence. A lot of other people who do exist get, unfortunately, into human abuse, human trafficking, sex slavery. And the first thing that a kidnapper does is destroy your documentation because it's paper. So the aim of the digital identity is going to come from this United Nations program, which started February this year. I was at the meeting where they started discussions. And the end of the discussion was a vision that by 2030 or before, Everyone who's got a mobile phone will have a mobile wallet capability and a mobile identity within that wallet. The mobile identity inside that wallet will be some form of biometric recognition, which means that you've got unique identity capabilities. And then you have to have a identity that goes with your biometric that's cheap. You, know, you can't have KYC that's cost hundreds of dollars. You've got to have a really cheap way of saying it really is you. And that's going to be based on some form of shared ledger a blockchain. And if Africa produces a really cheap digital identity scheme, is there any reason why we wouldn't use it? You know, the whole world would start using it? Particularly if the United Nations, World Bank and others say this is a good program, it's cheap and it's available to all. And we need this for the Internet of Things because I've got quite a few things. My Apple Mac, my watch of course, linked to my phone, my Apple TV, my Apple fridge coming soon, Apple car, maybe one day, depends if they can sort out their act. Uh, Apple house, Apple everything. <laughs> if you're Android, I'll give you the chance. You can be an Android. Um, but how do you know that all those things are mine? And how do you know that I've author authorized those things to do those transactions on my behalf? How do you know that I've said that my fridge could order 12 bottles of vodka this week? Because my Polish mother-in-law is coming to visit. How do you know that I authorised my TV to download Game of Thrones Season 9? 
how do you know that I've authorized those things? And you've got to know that in real time, immediately. It's got to be a cheap form of identifying my things, identifying me, and making those transactions happen. Because there's going to be trillions of transactions, non-stop, every day, between me and my things, and my friends and their things, and those other people with their things everywhere around the world. And so we are going to end up with some form of digital identity database shared amongst constituent parties, hopefully on a globalized basis, because that's what we're all going to need. And distributed, democratized, not centralized. Because if you have centralized, it's the easiest point to attack and steal someone's identity, as Neff said on an earlier panel. Which is where blockchain comes in. And blockchain gets really confusing because it's been so hyped. We heard a phrase earlier on, the trough of disillusionment. This is well in there. Yeah, this is in there in the trough of disillusionment, because basically blockchain overhyped under delivering. No one really understands it anyway, they just talk about it. What colour do you want it? Oh, mauve would be good. Um, and it, it's just basically a database on the internet, that's all it really is. A shared database on the internet, which is what distributed ledgers and blockchains are being discussed. The confusion comes in because there's quite a few different technical ways in which you can do a shared database on the internet. Um, but this core came out of the Bitcoin experiment. And so normally people, when you say blockchain, go, oh, Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin's a public blockchain. But there's quite a few other ones. And the questions you need to answer, first of all, is do you, I, do you actually need a database and do you need to share that database? You know, who needs to have access to that database? Do you trust them? If you trust them, then you don't need a blockchain. Just use a database. If you don't trust them and you've got to have lots of people accessing your database, then you need to have some form of control. So how are you going to control it? Um, are you going to do it through, it's just you and some friends who all access, but because you don't trust them, you want to have some inter-firm private capability, in which case you use Ripple, which is one blockchain. If you are having lots of people accessing and you need to have it in a form that has to have both a public transparency and a private structure, use Ethereum, which gives you the hybrid capability midway between a Bitcoin and a Ripple. Alternatively, use Bitcoin if it's completely pu public. So lots of challenging questions to answer to begin with. And the real thing is around the complexity of what's going on right now, which is the banks have all got excited about blockchains. In fact, insurance is the area where I think it's going to have a much bigger impact in the short term. The United Nations has got interested. But it's just a shared database. So the real core question is who is sharing it? And there's lots of excitement right now about clearing and settlement, for example, using blockchains. But actually, clearing and settlement is a problem with structure of the industry between central counterparties, central securities depositories, central banks, which doesn't get solved by blockchains and distributed ledgers. It gets solved by agreeing how we're going to share stuff. So actually, the fundamental is what are we sharing? And equally, blockchains are not the same as distributed ledgers. Ledgers are not blockchains. It's a difference. Because basically, blockchain is part of a distributed ledger. But it's only one part. You have to have a currency, digital currency. You have to have a digital signature. And you have to have some consensus mechanism that controls that structure. And we're seeing some things happening right now in financial services where there is excitement, there is interest. There's some live supply chain trade finance um, processes and workflows that are being used in uh, real life, not just in pr proof of concept experimentation by some of the banks. And there's lots of startups that are doing interesting things like Wave and like Abra. You know, if you didn't know it, Abra gives you the ability through the Bitcoin blockchain to transfer dollars from the US to the Philippines for, for free in real time. Near enough. Equally, you have lots of things around digital identity, which is where there's excitement in the United Nations and in many other areas. In fact, self-sovereign digital identity is discussed quite often here with companies like Evanim, where it says you own your identity and then you, do, you decide who you're going to give access to it rather than someone issuing you with an identity. It's your identity. You decide who gets access to your identity. And there's clearing a settlement, as I mentioned. And in a longer presentation, I'd spend a long time talking about those, but instead you can read my blog because I spent most of August writing about this in depth. So there's loads of stuff in the blog about it. 
I guess the biggest challenge for all of us is what currency should we be buying and investing in? You know, Bitcoin is now up at $750 a coin. It's going up. People are getting to go back to it, saying we trust it more. Equally, quite a few people are getting out of UK sterling because of Brexit and putting it in Bitcoins. Um, Ethereum. Uh, Zcash just launched last week, another new one. So right now, this is a development that's going to take some years. And blockchain is actually a core structural change, which is a big challenge. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. But it will be the foundation for a fast and almost free network of value for the Internet of Things. It's a core foundation technology that supports that. But there's lots of other things happening. It's the open sourcing of the financial system. If you look at the f typical bank or insurance company, they have a back office that manufactures products and services. They have a middle office that provides operational excellence, getting all the transactions from front to back office on time every time. And front office is all about having a nice customer relationship, customer intimacy, you know, moments of truth that are amazing. And then we have these lines of business that go across there. And the blockchain distributed ledger structures are going to redefine the infrastructure across the industry in the back office over time. And smart things is redefining the customer relationship. Right now we think of mobile social, but we should be thinking smart things. You know, all those things that we will own in the future. That's where the relationship is going to sit. Now, when we talk about marketplaces and platforms, really what we're saying today is that all those apps in the front office for the things that we use will be linked through the middle office via APIs to a back office that's based on cloud and big data analytics, or more importantly today, machine learning. And so that is actually the open source structure of the financial system. It looks nothing like the old one, the heavy lifting development shops of banks that build that integrated monolith structure. This is a marketplace that uh, should be available to anybody to play in because it adds value to the bank or insurance company to have more people playing. But the reason why most banks and insurance companies can't actually deliver on this is that they have a rotten core. You know, they have an old legacy merger and acquisition core structure. They don't have a digital core structure. And that's fundamental. You have to have a digital structure fit for today's regimes of open source marketplaces to play in the marketplace, to own the marketplace. And what I really think is happening is that banks made a fundamental mistake, which is that when they introduced technology in the 1960s, they put a big tin machine in the back office, a big Iron Man in the back office. That's what he looked like originally, by the way. I'm a Marvel nerd, so that's uh, Iron Man number one when he first appeared. You know, Y2K, we made him look really cool-ish. Um, kind of made him look a bit thinner, actually. And you know, now we've stuck a load of technology on top of um, the thin Y2K redeveloped mainframe Tin Man, and he kind of looks clunky. But that's what a bank looks like with its technology structures. You know, it's inflexible, it's difficult, it's old. But you stick a load of stuff on the outside to make it look pretty, and that's going to do the job. I don't think so, because fintechs come in, and maybe when fintech had an Iron Man. They thought, you know what, we've got open source APIs, apps, cloud services, so we're flexible. We can just rebuild them anytime we want, make them look better. Yeah, but let's do it again. Let's just keep a continuum of change around our tin machines because we have no restrictions, none at all. And it's been referred to a few times today about the third generation of fintech. And to me, the third generation of fintech is that banks have gone from this Y2K machine to starting to use fintech to build a different bank. <laughs> Anyone know where that's from? Avengers Age of Ult Ultron, come on, it's the Hulkbuster. <laughs> the Hulkbuster, so the Hulkbuster is basically a great big Iron Man that can beat up the Hulk. Um, but inside is the original Iron Man. And this is what fintech is doing with banks. You know, banks are layering on lots of technology on their old Tin Man, so you don't recognize him anymore, but he looks pretty brutal. And then whilst that's happening on the inside, you can reboot Iron Man and reveal the new guy eventually. It's going to be a few years, but fintech 3.0 is we're going to reboot the bank. It's going to get rid of all of that old, inflexible, rotten core and make it a really nice, flexible, digital core that's pretty cool and trendy. 
And that's what the Partnership Incubator Accelerator Hackathon stuff is doing. This is what it's all about, making a cool new bank using open source technologies. And it's critical that the bank does this if they're an incumbent, because it's happening anyway with all the fintech guys building marketplaces. In the back office, fintech is just components that in the middle office you can integrate to a front office aggregated user experience. That's incredible, amazing, different. That's what all these companies are there for. They're not threats. They're viewed as partners to an extent now, but they're players in our markets and banks have the right to own the markets because they have them today. Banks have millions of customers, billions in capital, thousands of employees. They need to get rid of a lot of those employees, those structures that are physical, and build their digital marketplace and invite everyone to come and play. And there are some that are doing it. Um, a couple from Europe, Saxo Bank in Denmark, Prevot Bank in Ukraine. Prevot Bank has a company that they launched in Silicon Valley called Causoid. And they're marketing APIs and apps and cloud services to anyone who wants to use them if, if they're interested in their marketplace. Um, CBW, we heard from earlier, is a marketplace-based banking structure. It doesn't own anything. It's offering a capability where you can plug and play their services into yours or vice versa. There's a couple in Germany that have launched Solaris Bank and Theodore Bank. These are brand new banks and they're tech shops. They are digital technology companies providing platforms and marketplaces to integrate APIs, apps, cloud, analytics, machine learning, whatever you want. You can plug as much of what they've got into what you've got as you, as you need. Solaris launched and were quite surprised that their biggest customer to begin with is an online retailer who is lacking half the pieces they need for online checkout from their bank partner. So they're getting it from a new startup fintech bank. There's a new company called Thought Machine that's in uh, the UK, created by a group of ex-Google engineers, a little bit like Suresh, but this is a group who just thought, you know what, we can do this. The banks aren't doing it. There's a little company called Ant Financial in China, you may have heard of. They're doing it. And by the way, at Money 2020 last week, Alipay, biggest ambition is to be a global player. Main aim is to get a million merchants in America by the end of this decade. You know, when we talk about who's the threat, it's not GAFA, it's not Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, it's Fatbag. Facebook, Ant Financial, Tencent, Badoo, Amazon, Google. I just like Fatbag. Anyway. <laughs> so in conclusion, what's the future? Well, we have a slight problem right now in that the future we are building is constrained by our blinkers. And going back to the Industrial Revolution, if you weren't on a steam train or a steam ship, your only form of transport was a horse. And horses created a lot of crap. Um, the streets were full of horse shit. Um, it was smelly, horrible, and hygienic. And they employed lots of people with spades to put this onto carts and then take them out of the city using their horse and cart which seems pretty stupid, actually, to have a horse taking the horse crap out of the city. Um, in fact, I was at the Halloween parade in the village yesterday, and there was a police horse lineup that looked beautiful, and then there were three guys behind with big buckets, you know, just walking behind them, clearing it up. This was what was going on all the time back then. And the Victorians, or the guys in the 1800s, had lots of ideas. They actually created the idea of the Hyperloop, which you may have heard from Elon Musk. Here is the Hyperloop. It's a big tube to transport people quickly to Bengal. Um, and they had faster horses, you know, steam-powered horses to get rid of the slop on the streets because it stank and it was horrible. And that's the vision of where you are at any point. You know, you think, We've got a problem with horses, let's build a steam horse rather than a car because we didn't know cars were coming. And so now we've got cars, what car do you want next? New BMW? New Hyundai? Or no, maybe you're a Nissan fan, or maybe you like Tesla, or maybe when Apple and Google do release something, you'll buy those. Because these are internet-enabled transport pods. They're nothing to do with cars. They drive themselves, and they're pretty cool. And whilst they're doing that, you can just play or work inside your vehicle, your pod. Um, so when I look at these use cases, I kind of go, we're really thinking about what we do today and just making it technology-enabled for tomorrow. Whereas actually what we should be doing is thinking differently. The biggest new fintech company in the world is probably uh, from here, PayPal, $48 billion valuation. Stripe's catching them up. 
right now, Stripe's valued at 5 billion 2015. I think they're probably more like 15 to 20 billion today because they're in Japan and uh, Singapore and Asia since that valuation. And financials valued at 60 billion. So when we think about platforms and digital versus the uh, old world, you know, Deutsche Bank is worth 16.5 billion. So, you know, Ant Financial is four Deutsche Banks. PayPal is three Deutsche Banks. Really sorry, Deutsche, I shouldn't pick on you. Okay, let's pick on Barclays. Barclays valued at 29 billion. So, Ant Financial is two Barclays. You know, when I look at the numbers from earlier on in the financial industry, old monolith physical structure companies with thousands of employees, centuries of history, valued at a lot less than the marketplace-based new companies that they're competing against. And you may say, Chris, you picked on Barclays, you picked on Deutsche, pick on someone who's meaty. Okay, JP Morgan Chase, as they've been here today twice. 235,000 employees, creating $245 billion in value. Fantastic. Let's just compare that with Stripe for a second. You know, Stripe, five-year-old company, based on last year's valuation, has $12 million of value per employee, which is 12 times more than... J.P. Morgan Chase's employees. And to be honest, I think Stripe's more like $30 million of value per employee. We are in a fundamental shift from the old physical industrial age to the digital age that's networked. And in conclusion, <laughs> this is my bank. <laughs> you may wonder why I'm putting it up there. Basically, I was doing a, present, a presentation at a conference, which was very nice in Bali a couple of weeks ago. And I walked along the beach. And when I came that, back down the beach, this guy was there. And I tried to get him back to life, but unfortunately he snuffed it. The puffer had snuffed it. And I thought to myself, you know, this little guy was probably, you know, he's a big fish. There's lots of big fish out there in these small ponds. And he was swimming around, eating and happy, and thinking, I go here every day and there's loads of food. And, you know, it's, life is good. Not realizing that every day he was getting nearer and nearer the shore until one day the tide just washed him up on the shore and dumped him there. And he wriggled and couldn't get back. And so my message really is that if I'm in a bank that's sitting there thinking, I'll just take the profits, the customers won't leave, I don't have any serious competition out there, don't be a big fish washed up on the beach. Thank you. <laughs>